Okay, so everyone, welcome. Hear me okay? It's a bit echoey. So this talk is about when less needs more. What on earth is this talk about, and am I talking complete heresy? Okay. Okay. So what do I mean when I say sometimes less needs more? Don't get me wrong, I love less. I love its elegant simplicity and the way it deals with scaling and actually leads the way to descaling. I love that its principles talk much wider about things like organizational design. It's not just about scrum metrics, mechanics. The website is amazing. It's all there, trust me, in really plain and easy to comprehend English with fantastic diagrams. And I absolutely love the Less Practitioner course, which covers all aspects from the contract game to systems thinking. Again, it's not just about scrum mechanics, but, and here's the rub, it's not so easy to implement. Um, trust me, <laughs> um, I should know I've been part of three less adoptions and in all of them I've had the most amazing less coaches alongside me. In one adoption, we even trained over 180, <laughs> what have we done? We've lost a screen. Anyway, in one of them, <laughs> we, had, we trained over 180 practitioners. That was well over a third of that entire department. Um, and in all of them, the guy at the top unreservedly championed us. So even with all this amazing good stuff going alongside us, willing us to succeed, people really struggled. There were some who just found it was just too academic, um, too conceptual, a leap of faith too far. Um, there were some people who really did get it, but they found all the learning and unlearning really quite exposing and threatening. That's okay. <laughs> Here we go. You just turn this round. <laughs> hey. Where were we? Okay. So I've talked about the people feeling a bit threatened, but then the bigger problem, of course, is the organization. It's a large entity. It has a real set vision on what it thinks agility should be, what, what success looks like, how the department should be structured, how people should report. So to those parts of the organization, less, our less inspired organization could look quite alien, quite contrary, even destabilizing. So this is a chance for me to talk about um, how we helped knit less into the fabric of an organization where maybe the outcomes or the values or the direction of travel weren't so closely or obviously aligned. Remember, less and scrum are designed to be barely sufficient. So I really hope that by sharing some of this with you, it may be of use to you all. And what we did do was create a framework, a TOM, a target operating model, which housed less. Um, it protected the core elements of it, 
so that it wouldn't dilute or diminish its value. But then we put a lot of focus on the other elements around it so we could really amplify the benefits and give it the best fighting chance of survival and embedding into and actually enriching the organization in which we worked in. I've um, said a lot about we so far, so I'd actually like to start with my shout outs. Um, and especially to, to Jeff and Chris. Jeff and I worked very collaboratively on the Tom for years. Because he was the COO, he brought the commercial and governance rigor and challenge, as well as his insane love of squares to nearly every diagram that we drew. And Chris Barker, whose only ask of me ever was to make sure I turned on at least one light bulb a day. So, who am I to feel able to tell this story? Um, so I think I've encountered many contexts and many environments in my working life, from startups, um, consultancies, being a mum. I read ancient history at university, and I continue to be influenced by the classics, but also cultural movements and some diverse thinkers. Um, I have a background in testing and in Scrum, obviously, and, uh, and I earned my Les Practitioner bag a few years ago. Um, but my professional career has culminated um, in these two positions that I held at Deutsche Bank. Director, performance management, head of talent, design of the operating model. So why am I so keen to point out that I held senior permanent positions during some of these adoptions? Because my main purpose isn't about pushing less. My executive focus is on the well-being of my people and the growth and success of my department and the company as whole. I'm actually not very precious or wedded to a particular way of working, but what I did find was less was a very useful way of helping me attain all of these goals. So, now for some disclaimers. <laughs> um, I stand by the use of our operating model. I'm honestly not saying it's the best way or the only way, but I am saying it, it, it worked in our context. That said, I am going to be quite bold, and I'm going to say our context wasn't so unique. So I'm really hopeful the insights that I share with you today may be useful for you and can maybe inspire you um, and, and create some light bulb moments of your own. Um, I don't think 40 minutes is really enough to do it justice, but I, I will try um, to, to cover as much as I can. So let's step back a bit. Why are we going agile? Yes, I know it's 2021, and uh, <laughs> Agile has been around for literally decades. But I kid you not, even this year, I was looking at slide decks talking about what are the benefits of agility discuss, OK? So um, yeah, it's still a relevant topic. Um, I also know this room is mainly full of Agile practitioners. So I think if we were to do a word cloud, it might look slightly different from this. We may have a, a learning culture, happiness, value, those kind of things. Um, but honestly, I think this is a more realistic representation, okay, of what some organizations want to optimize for. Um, I don't actually think any of this is particularly wrong or bad, but I do bring it to your attention because you can't and you really shouldn't ignore it. Um, people are motivated to push and adopt Agile for a whole host of reasons and some of them are not altruistic, OK? Um, my point is, you have to listen. You have to look. And actually, you have to own it. Um, if you start fighting this, there's no point. Um, put in reasonable measures and metrics to really try and help demonstrate the progress. Bring peace of mind and move the conversation on. <laughs> Um, of course, some objectives have nothing to do with direct, directly with agility. But as expression goes, pick your battles carefully um, to make sure that your team and you are set up for success. So with that in mind, 
And now I finally understood what the organization was trying to get. And also, I understand the expectations we had on ourselves. Um, we set about a way, trying to find a way of achieving this. And I introduce to you all the TOM. So, what is the TOM? What's a target operating model? Um, it's a way for us to define a framework on, of how an organization functions. Um, it's optimized to deliver on our vision, which is in, a session, was in its essence about customer delight and employee happiness. Um, I like working with Tom's for a few reasons. Um, so those of you who have a dog, like I do, probably know this guy at the top here, Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer. Um, and he, what he does is he takes these, these hapless dogs and he really finds a way to help them excel at being dogs. <laughs> um, how does he do it? I don't know if you guys are Caesar Milan fans. Rules, boundaries, and limitations. Um, his philosophy isn't to dictate every move that the dog and the dog owner need to make, but he sets out these clear principles and boundaries so all the parties know where they are heading. And in every episode, because frankly it's the same story every week, <laughs> the dog finds confidence in, well, in, 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 in what it, being a dog again, and it knows exactly what is expected of it and the rewards it will receive. Now, please, I'm not suggesting that engineers and developers are, are these, these sort of wild, untrusting, broken souls. Please, no, quite the opposite. My point is, no Tom will last a minute if you detail to the nth minute detail every process and every decision tree. They are always based on mutual trust and respected principles. So, to me, the Tom is really a collection of these principles, which includes rules, boundaries, and limitations. The T in Tom stands for target. It's an evolution. It's not this hard-coded blueprint that you must get to. We evolve as we learn and we grow. Our design welcomes change, which is really easy to do if you are principle-based. And then it's great because then others join in and we get a much richer picture of where we're heading. And finally, it helps um, our people with their narrative. By defining our ways of working and the ambitions in clear business language that the rest of the bank now understands, we can knit our department into this wider organization and our people feel able to, um, to, 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 to operate really freely without having to spend their time re-explaining and explaining and explaining themselves again. So, the Tom, what does it comprise of? Um, as I said, I won't cover every detail, but what I will do now is cover sort of the key elements where I feel enabled us to take the less framework and, and, and basically in, and, and support it. Well, the heart of the Tom is really the process, um, as you see here. <laughs> and uh, we're a technology organization, so for us, it was pretty much Scrum and the less framework. Um, it was really, really important to me that we did not bastardize any parts of less, that we didn't start off less like and then try to move towards less. After all, what do they say? There's no such thing, there's no thing more permanent than a temporary solution. Um, the framework was implemented at the start. And one of the very first jobs we did, in fact, was to define our products. And then we helped teams move on to them. So it was really, really important to me that when I said feature teams, I really meant feature teams. When we said multi-team scrum, we genuinely mean multiple teams working together on similar features. So, to enable all of this, we had to make sure that we got work onto the product backlog in the right way. So I created this demand management um, uh, framework here. Um, and it has three key elements about it. 
The first is it signposts to the bank how to engage with us through this sort of virtual front door. So it allowed us to guide our customers through the experience, and then we were able to set up expectations as we went. I think you can see it as sort of a low fear immersionary into the world of less. Um, the second thing is it really helped break some silos. Um, remember, we're not building organizations from scratch. We are actually taking existing organizations and helping them move on. So a key part of this was a triage process where we brought together the different departments. So we had engineering, support, um, um, product, and they would come together to understand the tasks that we needed to deliver. In time, I would observe what this did facilitate was a much wider definition of done, man, many fewer handoffs, and actually a real collective responsibility to what we were beginning to deliver. And finally, it helped satisfy the governance and funding points. Because you can't get away from the fact that although we were building products, we were always funded through a project or a portfolio lens. We're a bank. <laughs> so, this mechanism really helped bridge this in a really transparent and, and compliant way. And I hope, in a way, that helped protect our engineers for as much as possible from having to sort of skew their deliveries to meet financial milestones. Um, so this brings me to the next piece. Um, because Scrum might be the way that you want to deliver, but you actually need to get the structure right around it before you can get going. So this box is called Structure and Governance. Um, as I said, we set off on an uncompromising task of defining the largest, most sensible, customer-centric products which were within our control. Um, and I'd absolutely suggest you all do the same. <laughs> um, in one department where we, it was largely about portfolios, and everyone derived their um, identities from which technologies they worked on, we managed to create three products. In another department, which actually did have a concept of product, but it was very technologically focused, I think we took around 120 or so applications, 29 product families, and we, we made it into four products, and within a year we went down to three products. This was really painful. <laughs> really painful, and it wasn't without its distractors. But we knew if we didn't push from this from the very, very start, um, we'd never be able to make significant progress. Um, and the product definitions are an absolute key enabler for this. So once you have a view of the product, it then allows you to create departments and reporting structures that all make sense and give people a really clear idea of their idea identity and purpose. Um, and also, ultimately, pride. Um, we couldn't do this in a vacuum, of course. <laughs> Banking, like all highly regular... I'm going to have to stop. <laughs> Sorry. We're kind of all fun with technology today, aren't we? Um, this... <sighs> there you are. Tip for next time, have shorter hair. Um, right, so, uh, banking, like all highly regulated... You're gonna take... You're going to have to take it off. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, so we can do all this in a vacuum. So we've got our products, we've got our product line structures, but uh, like I said, we're a part of a bank, right? So banking, like all highly regulated environments, has numerous governments for, governance forums and compliance expectations. Um, so that we weren't considered an outlier, we made sure that we formally linked into all of them and actually invited audit in from the very first day of our, of our adoptions. Um, getting everyone really comfortable with your structure and governance will allow you to move on and make progress. So there, here are two more key boxes, sourcing and location and technology. Now, I didn't own the direction of travel on these two boxes because we had to follow the location, vendor, architectural strategies of the bank, right? But it was really imperative we thought about how we could support with them and work within them as effectively as possible to um, help the LESS framework thrive. 
So again, we took our product visions and roadmaps as a basis, and we pulled the conversations into our context to solve them. Because we'd already done the thinking uh, around the direction of travel, it was, it, was, it was such a bonus. And what it meant was that we could really hold steadfast to our plans about how we wanted to grow our products and our features. When we hired, we always made sure we hired in teams and not in individuals, so we could get scaled Scrum working from day one. And finally, we spent a lot of time analyzing the shape of the organization as it was today and where it was shaping to be in the future. And it meant that I could then go and challenge all of the departments and, 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 and say, how do we make this flatter? How do we start bringing in a sense of manager as teacher? And we brought in principles like buy one, train 10. And now we come to my favorite box. Um, something very close to my heart, people and talent. I know I started with the process box, but frankly, without this one, you may as well just go home. You can have the best ideas, frameworks, processes in the world, but all it takes is one poorly aligned person in a key role or a team with slightly different values, and it all comes crashing down really quickly. Trust me, I've seen it. Um, it's like the Achilles heel of agility. Um, one wrong hire, it quickly exposes for the fragility of the system. So this is why you absolutely cannot underestimate the work that needs to be done in this box. So I came up with a talent strategy that looked at the principles we needed to adhere to um, at each stage of someone's evolution. So, for example, starting with the, uh, the new hire, the job descriptions, they, we tailored them so they contained all of the key attributes that we wanted to see. And they were road tested against a diverse set of people, so all cultures, sexes, ages, you name it. We made sure that they all understood it and actually, more importantly, wanted, wanted to apply for the job, right? It had to be exciting to, to the people we wanted to hire. And when we did hire, we hired on based on attitude and values over experience in the hope of reinforcing our culture. I think I spent a lot of time here trying to solve um, the conundrums that a large corporation serves up. So for example, overnight, you're not gonna change it. If there is a forum where only directors and managing directors can go, you're not gonna get the SME in the room. You're just not. But by creating communities, and the existence of which were firmly part of the fabric of the ways of that we worked, and touch points, and uh, through, through delivery and communication events, what we meant, what enabled us to do was it allowed the SME to influence and their views were invited in. If one of the lenses for how you might be promoted, to your talk yesterday, <laughs> is about how many people you manage, uh, and you're a scrum master or a product owner, what, what then? Okay, so we spent a lot of time educating on these roles and helping those in the roles to navigate the company processes. I think the main thing that we did do was try to start seeing the person as a whole. If you're evaluated by what your line manager writes about you, and it's traditionally been a command and control, one-dimensional uh, relationship, how do we make sure, in addition to the pastoral care, that they also had the expertise growth and the opportunities for new experiences? So we start to instill a focus on seeing the person as a whole and remembering and instilling in all of our, our managers that, that talent is a team sport. It's a shared responsibility. I promise you I'm not saying I had all the answers, um, but I do really recommend, urge you all to put a lot of time into thinking about how you can bridge the company minimum standards to what you need for a generative organization and of course for less to flourish. And finally, uh, evidence and measures, and I feel I have to tread a bit carefully here now given Craig's keynote speech this morning. Um, <coughs> so, measures, measurements or metrics. Okay, so in large organizations, these are usually based on that false assumption that true output is known. 
Uh, so the desire to measure really does genuinely overtake everything. And we try to find the, the things which are easy to identify or easy to measure in the hope that it's a perfect substitution. You all know that. The uh, thing is, you can't really fight it. You can't really fight this desire to measure everything. Um, so you need to serve something up to tell the, biggest, uh, big, tell the bigger picture, um, which is really, it's not about the measuring. It's really about the discussions that it then evokes. Um, so one of the things that I did here was I set out by saying, as a principle, that a single measurement cannot be a perfect indicator. So you have to use a suite of techniques to tell the complete story. Um, so in here, you can see I did include the, the, the normal activity or KPI type measures. Of course, the ever popular and growing in popularity OKRs, but also surveys and go see. Um, there was, they, as I said, we had those published with a list of principles alongside of them. And one of them, for example, is you need at least two measures per outcome, preferably from two different sources, to validate any kind of progress. Measurement discussions always tend to tie people up in knots. Um, so my really big advice here is try and agree on the outcomes before you get into the weeds of discussions of how and why you're measuring. Don't run away from, from measures because they are an indicator to a conversation that needs to be had. And that's the key thing about measuring. So that's it. That's basically our Tom. Um, it's under, underpinned, of course, by our vision and uh, how we engage with our customers. This has been refined from our learnings for probably over eight years. And I, I'm really looking forward to seeing it evolve further, actually. Um, so if I was going to finish off, and I, there's a lot here, but if I could think about three takeaways I think you should take away from this session, I think there's this. Narrative, structure, and people. Create a narrative, set that narrative, own the narrative, and tell the story of the journey and take everyone with you. Do not get hung up on nuances of scaling frameworks. It may be tempting, but you know what? It's not the point. The outcomes are the point. The narrative sets out why you're doing this. In corporate speak, why are you doing this transformation? Make sure that you do point to the business benefits. Um, so if I take the two examples I've talked about um, in DB, that the stories were really quite similar. It was about simplification and consolidation of our offering and our locations. The removal of wasteful processes, the removal of excess roles, and actually about saving the bank money. <laughs> Um, how we did it, that's the exciting bit. It was about creating these customer-centric products, repatriating our code, making it better, cleaning it up, and actually a massive recruitment drive for brilliant new talent. And you know what? We did do it. We did manage it. I think COVID threw us off track a little bit um, in cloud and platform technology. But if I go back to treasury tech, so if we're talking about 2018 to 2019, we flipped our external internal stat from 70-30. So what that meant was within a year, we went to 70% internal and 30% external. We went from five releases a year to releasing every two weeks. And I need to get my numbers right here. We saved the bank over $25 million P&L, or that equates to $54 million in cash. Not bad. <laughs> and the less framework is really deeply woven into the narrative of the how. And because of this systemic approach, it really enriched the story, but it wasn't the point of the story. So set out that vision and story, keep sharing the benefits, keep everyone on the, on the journey, because this really helps protect your, your department to stay on track, and it gives your team so much confidence in the changes that are happening around them. Structure. <laughs> Do not underestimate the importance of setting out a clear vision of the structure from the offset. Um, I mean, it really did help that we had a very charismatic CIO who brought his peers with him. Um, but you may need to hold your nerve here. 
Um, it, found, it feels very counterculture to some people, but you really need to set this out to people so they understand where they sit and how to operate. You're probably bringing together lots of functions who've completely been siloed up till that date. It's something that people can really, really struggle with. So this idea of how you sit organizationally, so say you're a project, man a a project manager sitting in the COO department with the COO cost center, that's not how you deliver because you're delivering horizontally. And these sort of things people find really, really difficult to big heads around. So you need to bring, that, bring them together for that discussion. Um, you need to expose it and to tackle it. As they say, culture follows structure. So creating a strong structure with clear product visions is key. And finally, the people. Um, I think this is the hardest one. Um, here you have to tread really carefully. Imagine a person who's been told their whole professional career that the only way you make it to the top is by working in a certain way, delivering in a certain way, leading in a certain way, and then you turn up and you open the door, or a Pandora's box, but a good one, and you show them a different way. Some people will find this really exciting and they will really enjoy and completely thrive in an agile environment. Others are gonna find this really, really hard to come to terms with and they will resist, they'll struggle, they'll defend. The problem is, that's this Pandora's box. Oh, sorry, let's go back. This Pandora's box is open and you opened it. So you've helped cause this anxiety. Um, so you have to now get in there, really get in there. You've got support. You've got to educate. You've got to build safety nets. You've got to put out platforms. You've got to work with these people. And you've got to deal with the fallout. It's really exhausting. Um, so my advice is, my plea is, um, take every step really carefully and consciously. Because if things change suddenly, and they often do in big organizations, key people leave, there is a change in company direction or product vision at the top, you leave people really exposed. Um, and worse, they're perhaps now working in a way with where the people assessing them or, or directing them just have no idea how, how, how to work with them. And you're the one who encouraged them to make this move. So as a result, you can find that trust really takes a hammering and, and so does confidence. So please be careful. Um, but don't see this as a, as, as a talk of complete uh, caution, I suppose. I have seen people who we invested in go on to do amazing things in all different environments. So I suppose my point is, if you assess a situation isn't worth a less adoption or isn't worth taking that extra step in that, in that uh, agile transformation, what you mustn't do is stop investing in the people. Keep investing in the people. And now I'd like to thank you. <laughs> so that's it. That concludes my really high level, quick whiz through the target operating model. Um, if you would like to go through any of these details in, in more details of me, happy to grab a coffee or a beer later on tonight. But yeah, um, I hope that you found that useful. Thank you very much. I don't know if anyone wants to have a quick question. <laughs> I can't tell if you're looking quizzically at me, Greg, or... <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, in the uh, processes section, uh, you mentioned the uh, demand management uh, process alongside Less and Scrum. And from like a bird's eye view, that looks a lot like uh, a product backlog refinement. So uh, what's, what's the rela relationship between the two and, and why did you choose to like bring that front and center there? So, so I hope you all heard that. So, so 
the, so the, the demand management bit is the bit that we tagged on to the beginning. So this is the stuff that even happens before product back, backlog review. This is about getting in, speaking to our customers, getting them to think about how about articulating your, your demand in, with outcomes, with some business benefits? Uh, let's, let's educate you in the way of prioritization. So it was about bringing those together. I mean, one of the things that I didn't bring attention to, but you can sort of see is the product owner. The key product owner in big organizations is a really funny one because we say the product owner should ha you know, be the one who makes a decision in a bank, who is that, right? It doesn't work like that. So we did have product owners, but we had them in our context. And what our product owner did then was to go out and speak to all of the customers, get them on the same page, educate them, bring that demand in. So all of that demand is actually, all of that stuff you saw, I don't know if you realize, the end point was actually the product backlog. It's all the work you do before you even get to the product backlog because that's where you have to start. You can't just start from the less framework. It's part of that knitting together the two, the two worlds. So you talk about this uh, hiring thing, <coughs> uh, hiring thing, like like one one wrong hiring can fragile the process. I like that statement. Um, the question is like I know knowing about the Deutsche Bank, so there is a lot of uh, lot of external vendors who are involved. So how you how you dealt with that? Because I know there is a lot of external vendors who will be the part of team working closely with the Deutsche Bank. Like how you actually bring those those ideas or principles into the vendors, which is always kind of a tricky situation when you are having a contacts running and doing it with the vendors. Yeah, so I don't know if that question is about external. So the, the, there's two types of externals. There are the, the contractors, say, the person who comes in and sits next to you at the desk, but maybe, you know, he doesn't actually work for Deutsche Bank. We just consider them part of our team. If they, if, if, you know, if, if you're going to put your heart and soul into this role, I don't care whether you're a contractor or, or a permanent member of staff. And actually, that worked quite well. We found that a lot of these people actually did want to convert to becoming permanent because they thought, hey, actually, this is a nice place to come and work. Vendors is a different problem, and you're right. A lot of vendors sell themselves in with their own methodologies, with their own frameworks, which absolutely do not work in a less framework, okay, because they like to take the big bunches of code. So if you notice what I said in one of the things was we moved our 70, 30, and that's exactly what we did. We looked at our vendors and said, actually, this isn't the way we want to work. We want to repatriate our code because otherwise, how can we create these amazing customer-centric products because you're sat all the way over there in God knows where they were sat. So we did a lot of work with actually bringing our stuff back and trying not to have such a heavy vendor reliance. It was a difficult um, conversation to have because it did break the way that the bank likes to work. But I think, as I said, we, you have to show the big picture of what we were doing. And, and overall, that, that, that seemed to work. So if you speak about vendors, I often see that before you come to that discussion, you have the problem that you have like marketing and sales and that this is not in your company totally. So you have like brokers who bring you business. Um, where are the boundaries? Or where, where have you had these boundaries where you're saying, we can't really own the whole product. We have parts of it by somebody else and yeah. it's a corporation and yeah. the corporation has an interface and an interface for less adoption might be difficult. Yeah, I mean it helped that we were largely technology and, and what I mean that is as you can imagine the big banks they do really separate front end from back end technology. Um, so one of the key things I said is we had to define a product that we felt was as big as possible within our control. And, and, that, and that was really where we had to sit and really think hard about the structure of where we were going to cut those lines off consciously because there's no point trying to do something which is out of your control. And that's where the demand management flow comes in as well because then what happened is if we had customers who were front office, we would then try to influence. Um, there is only one of our products out of the seven I've talked about where we are ready to now um, pass that back to 
to the, to the business side because what we've done is the, the, the product owners role model the behaviors, taught them how to do it. And actually now we can in, increase that definition of what that product is to bring in uh, because the person in the business will be able, it's within his domain to be able to bring that into the product. But we conscious, consciously cut it off and did not make it part of our product definition. Did, did you do that somehow in a structured way? Can you show us your plan? <laughs> <laughs> did it? I mean, like, like I said, the, the, the key is, and I, I've talked a few about this, I, I'm very fortunate in that I work uh, in, at, at a point where we, we have a lot of, you know, my, my CIO can make these decisions. He's senior enough to say, right, this is how we're going to work and the, around the world, the, 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 the stuff that I own. The, the bigger, the higher, the, the, the bigger piece you can grab, then you can really get a less huge adoption going. But you need to own so many elements of it and have a lot of that in your world. So I'm very fortunate at Deutsche Bank we had that. And, and I hopefully think that we did the best we could, given, given all of that. Greg, sort of this question. Well, I just had a couple of questions. So um, it seems like at, at your bank, along the lines of the Ysoft uh, CEO's uh, talk, you were clear about what they were going for rather than telling them what they should do. So they wanted to reduce cost and you reduce cost. Um, whenever there's a cost discussion, it's, there's often also a value discussion. And I'm curious if you had uh, both a monetary value discussion yeah. and then the kind of human side morale, yeah. how people feel discussion, if those entered into the measurement of the impact. Absolutely, and I think this goes back to that narrative thing. Um, and again, this is, I've got to give a lot of credit to, to Jeff, who, who as a COO was always able to balance the human story with the, with the financial story. So um, always the narrative talked to both. The narrative always talked to the cultural aspects as well as, and you still get, you know, here's just, you, you know you're trying to save money, and actually this is a way, and we do it in a nice way. It's not about redu reduce, reduction of waste. It's about reducing waste to create space for more value. And I think if you can f feed those things into the narrative, but make it sound sort of business-like, I think that's the way you do it. Um, so like I said, the, the real key, key thing was to do a lot of thinking up front and just holding our nerve, right? A lot of this is about holding your nerve in some of these conversations. Nice, thank you. I like the fact you brought it to a higher level. You know, this kind of reduced cost is such, a, <laughs> such an uninspiring uh, message. Yeah. So, thank you. We good? Are you all hungry now? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much.